Hi, everyone. This is Betsy Wurzel, your host of Chatting with Betsy on Passionate World Talk Radio, where our mantra is to educate, enlighten, and entertain. Folks, as I always have to say, in the month of September, and September is going by rather quickly, that it is World Alzheimer's Awareness Month. And September 21st is World Alzheimer's Awareness Day. I want to encourage everyone who's listening, please share your stories if you were a caregiver or are a caregiver. Please post on your page. Show this disease. Show your journey. We need to put names and faces and personalize this disease. And please, if you have any memory issues, concerns at all, please consult your primary care physician about it. It's also Suicide Prevention Month. People are struggling, and don't judge people. The suicide uh, hotline is 988 for those in the U.S. If you have any mental health concerns, issues, please consult with your primary care physician about resources and referrals in your local area. And um, that's what Chatting with Betsy is about. It's about encouraging people and helping people. And today, I have a very phenomenal, interesting guest that I'm really honored to have on with me. My guest today is Margaret A. Harrell. She is author and writer of 18 books. She is one of a handful of Lumen Essence light body teachers in the United States who are permitted to teach the most advanced light body courses. Um, you can find all that information on margaretharrell.com, which is the website which will be in the blog. And today, we're going to talk about this book, which I read, Keep This Quiet Too, More Adventures with Hunter S. Thompson, Milton Klonsky, Jan Mensart. And I just am so excited. So I want to welcome you, Margaret A. Harrell, to okay. chat with Betsy. <laughs> Welcome. I'm excited too. I'm excited too, Betsy. Well, first I have to tell you, Margaret, I love your book cover. I love the road. I like that you have the three men's photos on it, but you are on a, it looks like a motorcycle. Some kind of, um, <laughs> is it a motorcycle or is it one of those ATV vehicles? And it's, the smile on your face, I love it. It's um, on a visit to California. It was a kind of a uh, park, or so it's not a real <coughs> motorcycle. It's a it's something you could sit on. But I loved sitting on it. So I, I love it. One. And the look on your face when I see your when I saw your picture, and folks, I never met Margaret before. This is my first time talking to Margaret. When I looked at your picture, I said, "What an interesting, vibrant." energetic person I can't wait to interview because you have lived such a fascinating life um, and, and reading your book keep this quiet too and I always ask the writers and, and authors is what inspired you to write this particular book why did I choose to write it well see I lived I After being born in North Carolina in a very small town on the eastern coast, I I wanted, I just had this great ambition to to see something more than a tiny little town. And so I started going to larger and larger and more and more distant places. Um, So I went to Duke. Then I went to New York and I worked there in a publishing house, Random House. But I, that, that was, and that was, absolutely thrilling and I knew these three men on the cover um, Milton Yon and Hunter at that time they formed a seminal uh, seed of the rest of my life a, a huge impact a huge teaching moment that just grew from there like an acorn into a tree but I married Jan, and so I went to Belgium where he lived but he uh, had moved to Morocco because he was an adventurous poet so I lived in Morocco with him, and then I lived 
in Zurich, Switzerland, because I wanted to go to the Carl Jung Institute for three years. But I visited Belgium and fell in love. Um, so I stayed there 17 years, and then I came back to the U.S. So now I don't remember what I'm sure my question is. But I wanted why I chose to write this book. Because I, when I got back to the U.S., I had always been a writer since age seven. So I'm back in the U.S., I'm now uh, like around 46 or something, and nobody knows me here because my books were published over there in Romania. And I, w I said, well, I want to appeal to an American audience. What do I do? So I said, I'll start with something that's down on the ground because by then I had become very spiritual. I had discovered my spiritual side. I said, but I won't start there. It's too hard to jump to that for an audience when I have no audience. So I said, I'll go back to New York in my 20s and I'll start with Milton, Jan, and Hunter because Hunter was famous with a lot of people. Milton had a little cult group in New York Jan was famous in Belgium. I wasn't famous. I was like totally unknown. So I would start with them. I would start with them and I would build from the ground up. Now Keep This Quiet Too was the second book. So I was building from the ground up. And I by Keep This Quiet Too, I could relax and add letters from Jan that I thought were um, inter entertaining and very instructional. And I could add um, philosophical wisdoms from Milton that I had collected with my pen. Whenever he was talking, I would memorize them and run to the bathroom and write them down. And then Hunter being famous, I would include some of his letters, and I got permission. So that's, I was building up, there is a Keep This Quiet 3 and 4, which gets more, and Keep This Quiet 3 is in the Carl Jung Institute in Zurich, and 4 is my mystical uh, experiences. Wow. And each one of these men, you were married to Jan, but the uh, other two, Hunter S. Thompson and Milton Klonsky, played a very important roles in, in your life. And I like how you showed that in the book. Now, I myself um, must have been living under a rock because I never heard of Hunter S. Thompson until I read your book. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I read this book a while ago, Margaret, so I might have to refresh my memory. Uh, there was a movie based about him, but I never saw that movie. What movie was that? Do you remember? Um, well, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and The Red Diary. It. Johnny Depp. Yeah, Jeff Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. They're characters, but, they're, but Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas is his version of himself, when he's trying to depict the 1960s and the drug, the um, the summer of love, the, the hippie mm -hmm. uh, flower movement, and the drug culture that led to it, a, a really a down a collapse of itself, a wave he called it a wave that rolled back on itself. It, um, it, there was an inspirational aspect, but it it then collapsed. It went. It didn't go anywhere. The 60s became freeing in a lot of um, like uh, racial movements and all that stuff. Um, but his he he focused here in this book on the on the rise and fall of the um, it, the ironic humorous depictions of this drug culture in Las Vegas. It, it's terribly amusing. The the man searching for the American dream and the American dream he can't find. He thinks it's died. But the Rum Diary was also played. A, a, it was truly fictional and but based on Hunter's life in South America. And it was also played by Johnny Depp. And the character Johnny Depp would play would always be his version of Hunter, whom he went to Al Farm to uh, copy the movements of, the idiosyncratic movements and speech. And they were both born in Kentucky, um, Johnny Depp and Hunter, and they became fast friends. Well, wow, that's incredible. I was, when I was reading your book and I said, oh, yeah, I never didn't, Get a chance to see that that movie uh, because for ten years I wasn't able to go to the movies, and but I do remember uh, hearing that that book. And can you tell us a little about Milton Klonsky? Because um, people may not be familiar with him either. I know I wasn't. 
No, um, there was a collection of his essays posthumously published by a university called A Discourse on Hip. Now, Milton was fabulously uh, unique, <laughs> I want to say. <laughs> he, he was both fabulously, um, and I use that without exaggeration, intelligent, but he was also incredibly grounded, like commonsensical, able to relate to the, to the man on the street, as you call it. Uh, in fact, anyone that I was really attracted to had that ability. They couldn't be just in, up in the air, but I liked an intellect that could go up in the air and capture rare insights and, and master them uh, or absorb and, and assimilate them and tell them to me, <laughs> you know, because mm-hmm. I used... And Milton could do that. He was famous in New York from Greenwich Village as a talker um, in soirees, as a writer for magazines like Commentary, uh, Hudson Review, Partisan Review in those days, big magazines. Um, and for for me, he was around the c- corner for me. So I would, uh, he was romantically interested in me. I was interested in his mind, honestly, and his, um, just being around him, his persona. And so I would go to his house almost every, his apartment almost every night. And we, and I would even take the manuscripts from Random House and he would uh, like watch me work on them and com- make very uh, interesting, clever comments, insightful. So, um, I can't, you can only capture Mills, all three of these men, you can only capture truly if you talk to them. Their presence was so great. That's why I picked them out. They had a huge presence that I could not um, imagine if I hadn't met them. And so my final reason for picking them was that I... I was asked by uh, a publisher, a traditional publisher, to just stick with Hunter, and and she would take the book, an agent, a literary agent. She would take the book, and they would uh, choose his letters to excerpt from. I didn't want that at all. That wasn't the point at that point. I wanted to show all three of them, uh, record some of the things I had preserved from their life that you could find nowhere else in the world and show how, though I didn't sort of like preach it, that the three of them were helping me discover my own self. Because a female, especially in that era where I came out of, needed models for her inner masculine self. And so I was discovering my inner masculinity, my, my strengths that we call masculine that I couldn't access because I would project them onto males. So first I had to project them onto these three males, clear projection, because they also um, uh, incarnated and demonstrated these qualities, like not being afraid to say your, speak your mind. I was terrified to speak my mind. You know, me as a female sitting there timidly in public. But they weren't. So I kind of hid in their shadow, as it were, and learned how to speak up and say whatever I wanted to say. So I chose those three to help illustrate those qualities, and I tried to show how they did it and what they taught me without trying to teach. Well, I I think it was great. And to put it in perspective for the audience, this was during the uh, 60s, um, if I remember correctly, and uh, 70s when women... Uh, you know, you didn't speak up, you were afraid to speak up. And if you were assertive, you know, men kind of looked at you like, what are you doing? You know, women were taught to basically be quiet. You know, there were or the secretaries. Right, right. Not to speak up, not to give your opinion. So to me, Margaret, you're a role model and you, um, just a role model in, in your book because you were like, you know what, I got, I had this to say. And you learned from these, from these men, which I think were, uh, you know, awesome. They're all three so different. And you were married to Jan Mensart, who taught you a lot. Um, Jan was very deep. Um, I found him very uh, a complex, I think, uh, in, in more ways than the other two. 
Thank you. Thank you for noticing the complexity of Jan. You're right, because he had a very yeah. dark side, but but he, <laughs> yes. he treated it lightly. The thing, I would not have been attracted to a simply dark side. I, I simply would not. But he treated it so lightly. That was the mystery of it. He was able to handle his um, ultra sensitivity, which created the dark side, with um, like total, uh, like tiptoeing, <laughs> like lightness. And that was part of his fearlessness. At the same time, he wasn't very masculine in, in persona. He, that, was, that all went together and made the complexity. You're right that I learned a lot from him. Yes, they're very complex. But, and, you know, oh, go ahead. Go ahead I more. was going to say, I, stepping back, I saw him as, I saw both of us, I saw me as being in my shadow trying to draw out the light, and he as living inside his shadow, but letting the light pop up. And so we were both going into, let's say, areas which had darkness or in a shadow way, which were part, which were containing light, but you had to mine it and dig into it and find the light that was there and then bring it out. So that's the way I see that. I couldn't stay forever because getting that light, I had to leave. And I, and my sort of like final understanding was he wanted to stay there where he was in that kind of level or way of seeing things. And I wanted to get out and go back in to, to, um, I wanted to drop a lot of that that I had learned. I wanted to say, okay, I got it, and go and go into a different kind of consciousness. And, and like yeah, I, and yeah, Jan, uh, for some reason, Margaret, stands out to me more than uh, the other two. I think because of Jan's complexities that he did have this, you know, dark side back then you know mental illness was not addressed he had abuse as a a baby as a child and you didn't talk about it back then he was also gay which we didn't talk about back then it was closeted so he (laughs) hid you know a lot of things that i think because of hiding and and you couldn't talk about it then he drowned his pain with alcohol. Oh, absolutely. But he was, I would say he was bisexual. His first uh, sexual experiences were gay, true. But I do believe he, he was bisexual, but because, his, because he had this trauma with his nurse as an as a t- infant, and his mother fired her when she found out, but it was kind of too late. He... He started out having this kind of fear of women, and from there he went into his first, he was approached by someone else, he didn't seek it out, but he had his first sexual experience at 18, which wasn't too unusual back then, especially for someone so artistically and artistic sensitive sensitive as he was. But... um, yeah, he had he had this incredible complexity, but he was incredibly attached to me. At the same time, the moment you know we first hit it off, and um, I think maybe that's... you are attracted to him because not only was he uh, uh, alcoholic, um, he which was in part of his alcoholism was very gay and happy part got dark but but dark he didn't hurt anybody he he just got gloomy and what he called melancholy he said he had melancholy but combined with that he got suicidal he was suicidal before i met him he wasn't suicidal in morocco but every time he got back to the stressful what he considered very uptight uh, Western culture in Europe, he got uh, suicidal again, which is why we wound up living in Morocco. And yes, yes he had, he was, um, it, but yeah. he, was, he was one of those artists whom you cannot separate the mental illness facet from the art. So it, it, that adds more complexity. Um, it, it adds more complexity. Yes, the mental I, I illness think, did not prevent the art. Right. 
Right. I, I think that he, that Jan was creative because of it, from um, the way I see it. You know, he took the pain, he, he was an artist, and I think from what I hear from a lot of artists, whether it's um, an artist that draws or, you know, writing or singing, writing music, they get a lot of their inspiration from their pain, from their background. And I just think that, you know, the, the work that, you know, he did, I mean, I kind of understood him. Um, I see. I'm so yeah, glad. I really, I really did understand him. And I'm thinking, oh, this poor man, uh, I wish he was alive. I would have loved to have given him a hug. Um, and dealing, you know, with issues because, uh, Margaret, I mean, not that I'm, I'm not a mental health expert, but I am a mental health advocate, and I've had my own mental health uh, issues, and I guess I am a complex person, but when people hide their pain, it comes out one way or another. You know, either we uh, numb it with, um, and I n- never did with alcohol, but, you know, alcohol, drugs, sex, shopping, um, whatever form of addiction people use uh, to numb their pain. And I think that um, Jan was a, a conflicted um, individual, but I'm glad he had you to, you know, show love to. They, you know, you, you really loved him, and you could tell that by reading this book. Um, the relationship that you had was, I, I think, quite intense. And special. Well, he counted on me to be the normal person, and I mm-hmm. had wanted to go have adventures with him, so that wasn't at all my plan. <laughs> um, yeah. So, what you're saying is, is, is you're it's extraordinarily insightful about being an artist, but it's not only limited to art. So he took pain, and he. At first, he didn't invite it as a little tiny infant. Later, he, he in a way, kind of invited it, as people do, but um, not entirely. It just, it was, it, was, it was rooted there. So he took the pain, and pain being, like I teach in light body, luminous body work, energy body work, everything is energy, and it becomes matter, and then it goes back into energy. So... If you, if you are stuck at a certain point in the movement, then that's all you feel or experience. So, he, so what he did and an artist does, he takes the pain, which is energy, um, painful, painful energy, but he transforms it into art, like a sculpture transforms uh, like stone into a sculpture. He takes the pain and not able really to just sit there and live in it, and that's not the the inclination of an artist it becomes creative energy and that creative energy takes a form by being transformed and and it becomes matter again so pain and emotion based on an experience usually turning into energy um which is transformed into by creative energy and depth and moving, moving it along the spectrum, transforming it into matter art. So, and then there's a great satisfaction in that. And then you, bu- like him, you can bubble up with joy. He bubbled up with joy every time he created a poem, and he was almost clicking his heels together. So that was the, that was the joy and the escape. But you're right. There, there is a connection, and the the um idea of trans of anything that you experience you can take like an illness you can take an illness and you like uh, put creative energy into it instead of um despair and doom put creative energy into it look to see uh how you can create um connection or joy or something or hope out of it creative energy then you're going to get to a transformed you may get cured you're going to get something positive if you try to make this dark thing positive exactly yes and that's um 
very powerful that you said that, Margaret, because uh, when my husband had Alzheimer's, I created a group called Hashtag Kick Alzheimer's Ass Movement. And people would say, Betsy, you know, why did you come up with that name? And I said, because if it was either going to kick my rear end or I was going to kick its rear end. And how do you, you know, had the mindset. You have to live your life. You have to take whatever pain that you've had. I mean, this is what I did, Margaret. Took my pain. I turned it into a passion. I turned it into a purpose. And I learned to enjoy every day with Matt. I appreciate life more now than I ever have before. Uh, I see the beauty in, in living in life more now than ever before. So we can turn our pain into a purpose, and we can see the beauty amongst the tragedy, if that makes any sense to anyone. Um, so thankful you know, for Matt's journey. And I know you're thankful for the journey that you had with these uh, three uh, fine uh, gentlemen. Um, Absolutely. You know, it's, as you said, you have to live your life, the life that's in, presented yeah. in front of you. It's no good just wishing, gee, if only so-and-so, unless you're going to do something about it. So you became a tremendous example yourself in taking what presented itself in front of you and saying how can we find something positive here do the best with it and I, I was telling you beforehand about in keep this quiet too um, the, the, the epigraphs are a beautiful framework for the content of the book and one of the epigraphs is appropriate here the world is the great gymnasium where we come to make ourselves strong. That's Vivekananda. And so the great gymnasium, that, that's basically and making ourselves strong in that gymnasium with the workouts we get. So that's exactly what we're talking about. Yes, yes, um, that is beautiful, and that is so uh, on target, uh, Margaret. I'd like for you to talk about your... Well, light work, how did you get into that from, you know, what you were doing into, you went to the, how do you pronounce that, the Young Institute? Young. And the call, you, well, Jung. I, I I'm, heaven knows what, you know, there are different pronunciations of words. I say Carl Jung, but that's influenced by living overseas. So I don't know what somebody here might say, actually. I say Carl Jung. I look at it, which is, and I look at, you know, like I would look at it and say Jung, but it's probably not pronounced that way because it's in Switzerland. So Yes. Um, yeah. Jung. <laughs> the, it becomes a Jung. Y. The J becomes a Y. Right. Um, Jung is the Duke. So, um, so how, I got, how I got into yes. light work. Okay, so I was living in Belgium, and okay, I guess you have to go back a little tiny, tiny bit. So I left my husband, and I went um, pretty soon. I I left my husband after Milton Klonsky died, and I had this incredible, like dreams were talking to me, and he was coming into my dreams, and I had this incredible um sensation or like it was almost irrefutable that he ha had started guiding me after death and I thought I mean this is really weird I thought is it even possible um, I I can't ignore it but I can't accept it unless I get some support and some more uh, insight by experts in this field so for the, so the first time I decided after all this time to see a psychic who was very basically renowned. He was considered uh, the successor to Edgar Cayce, the sleeping prophet, by the Edgar Cayce Foundation, A-R-E. So I found out that their most highly reputed psychic was Al Minor, channel of Lama Singh. I went to him and said, am I being guided by Milton? And he told me absolutely yes. And so then I had to explore this whole um, world where spirit guides existed 
and test it and see how it related to me and what was going on. The only reason I did that even so was because I believed in Milton so much. And if he was, if people were telling me, people who knew these things, that he was there guiding me, I thought I had better know more about um, spirituality. And so then I began to, I went to courses in a, a community in Charlottesville, Virginia, and from there to the Jung Institute. This was still on this path of trying to learn that. And then when I got to Belgium, I was still taking now and then these, um, I was taking psychodynamics and mystical Tai Chi. And finally, one day I saw this advertisement, this announcement, not advertisement, um, light body course. It was coming from America. And I had never heard the words, but looking at the word light body, something went boring in my head. And I said, wow. So I, I immediately signed up, having no idea of the teacher. I knew the center he was going to teach in was very reputable because I had been there. So I went to the first light body course that was taught in Belgium in 1990, and I'm still taking the courses, And except the founder, just both founders just passed um, within the last two years, one of them within in August. So you can't take courses right now, new courses. But I became, when I came back to the U.S., I became a teacher. But all those years between 1990 and 2001, before coming, while in Belgium, I was taking that course. I learned, I discovered that it just resonated with me. It, it, um, it accelerated my writing because it was like somebody whispering in my ear saying, yes, you're on track, keep going, keep going. The energy was always around me. The the co-founder, uh, Dwayne Packer, is luminescence. Um, the co-founder, Dwayne Packer, since I was a teacher, was always sending me um, what you call transmissions, meaning sending me energy. And I actually was very aware that my life was on a much better course and I kept getting uh, surprises and opportunities. I was, everything was falling into place more and more the more I took this course. And, of course, the other founder, Sinea Roman, did wonderful work too. So it worked. That's why, that's why I kept taking it. It worked. That is uh, it's very interesting, and uh, I know in your website you do offer uh, workshops. Um, do you still offer that, Margaret? Yes, but um, as the world advanced, you know, I teach uh, online on Zoom uh, most of the time because you don't have to be right here, but you have to have uh, you, you have to have an, a personal contact. So I use Zoom, but for me personally, it usually works out that somebody calls me up and I teach them privately. I start right then whenever they want to start, but usually it's right then. And we go through the whole six-month course of Awakening Your Light Body, which is the required foundation, uh, just one-on-one. -on -one. Um, that seems to work because it's such a particularized uh, course and it, 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 you get such shifts in your own life that it works very well to have like a mentor there who's seeing you through and you can get feedback and you can come and talk to me about anything. So I also like kind of coach the people through. Therefore, it turns out for me, it's mostly private. It can be a little group. There's no problem with that either. But I do teach it. Oh. And I, use, I will even offer an introductory free uh, hour with me if someone wants to first experience what it's like and see if they want to go further. Oh, that's uh, very nice. Uh, thank you. Do they have to use a special code? No. You, um, you just go on the website and you go to contact and you write me that you are interested or you uh, call me on the phone. Um, but going to the website and filling out, you know, it's not, I don't use complicated contact forms. You just fill out, you just write your question into the contact box and it goes right straight to me and um, I email you back. Of course, 
I actually find out that not, very often it it requires a telephone call that has to, to actually decide for the person to decide because um, it's a it's a it's a very big decision. To, this is not just uh, a weekend course. It, it, this, Awakening Your Light Body is a six-month course where you, uh, you come to me once a month on Zoom and we spend a couple of hours together going over uh, the light body um, fre- frequencies and you, get, you get, give me feedback to what your experiences are, any shifts are, and I help you with that. And then you go home and you have homework, which is a download of um, each month a different box, a different, a different uh, group of journeys that Luminescence prepares and that you buy from them, um, marvelous journeys. They build, they are, Light Body is considered uh, an octave more subtle than the chakras. It, that, the coursework is very aware of the chakras, but this goes into more subtlety. It also builds up, uh, builds up the spine. So the first light body center will be down with the first chakra, and the, and the last light body center will burst through your crown of your head and uh, stream down. So it's, um, right, it's a parallel to the chakras, but uh, an octave more subtle. Well, that sounds really interesting. Margaret, I can't I thank you enough for coming on my show today. You are, uh, isn't Margaret the fascinating folks? I mean, I think so. I'm going to say yay. Uh, you are quite an amazing, fascinating uh, woman. And I, I want to well, thank so you for you. writing. Oh, thank you. I think you're writing your book and all the work that you do to help others. When I read about you having dreams about uh, Milton, I could relate because Mac comes to me in my dreams every night. Uh, oh. I actually I ask him to, to visit me. I do. I ask Matt to visit me. And, um, you know, people might think I'm a wackadoo and that's okay. I feel Matt's presence with me. I really do. I guess they'll smell him sometimes. People, yeah. yeah, I feel him with a me. A lot of people do a lot of people have that experience it's not like it, it before you have the experience yourself you might you know reject it that because you you believe your own experiences and not everybody has that experience after someone passes but if you open yourself to seeing if you can feel the presence in some way even animals look at dogs and all people tell me well I too sometimes but the presence is available in most cases and in some cases there might be a reason why there's no sense of presence it might be the way it's supposed to be but if you open yourself to it um see what happens yes yes um I'll tell you what we could do a whole nother show on that Margaret on just your work yeah you know with um luminescence i mean that's just uh fascinating i think people would be quite interested so um i would love to have you back and we could talk about your uh your work because i think it's fascinating you know people kind of tend to shy away from that i think it's you know woo woo and um (laughs) other names they they you know call it but i i could tell you i've had signs from that and now people could think whatever they want. I don't really care, but I know what I saw. I know exactly well, what I saw, and I still remember it. Can I just say one last thing then? Sure. Um, if, you lock, if you lock yourself into a mindset, you will never grow. And that's okay if that's what you want. You remain on this horizontal single spot. <laughs> but if you open yourself to the... Even in quantum mechanics, in quantum mechanics, they don't talk as science. They don't talk about simply matter and, and a life, ener, all life is energy that is either matter or waves. Matter is concrete to us in our own minds, and waves is something else. But no, they say everything is not just energy, it's matter waves. It uh, mass changes into energy and back. 
matter changes into waves and back. So um, if things are matter waves, they cannot be just three-dimensional. So because three-dimensional is what we perceive of as solid reality. So it's not scary. It's absolutely mind-blowingly fascinating to see what happens when you think, okay, I, I, I know some dimensions of myself. What about all the dimensions I don't know? That's fascinating. It's not, it's not very scary. It, it's an adventure like any adventure. So that's all. Yes. I, and so the energy work is um, trying to give you foundation for that so that you feel on uh, strong ground, not shaky. I love it. Um, you can build. Yes, yes. You are a gem. You know that. You are a true, tr- true treasure uh, to, to speak with. And the information that you have, the energy, the passion that you give off is incredible. I wish I could hug you. I'm sending you a hug and via the oh, airwaves. <laughs> I got it. Uh, I got it. I hug you back. Thank you. Thank you. I could feel it. Um, just uh, really, I so enjoy talking to you and I'm very honored to have uh, read your book and to talk to you. And I would love to chat with you again on um, my show next year, which is right around the corner. <laughs> this year is going yeah, by so fast. I would love to talk with I would love to talk with you again, too. It's a marvelous experience for me. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm glad. And uh, if people want to connect with you, folks, go on, and it will be in the blog, go on Margaret Harrell, uh, M-A-R-G-A-R-E-T-H-A-R-R-E-L-L.com. It will be in the, the blog and the book, one of 18 books that Margaret uh, Harrell wrote, Keep This Quiet Too, that's T-O-O, uh, apostrophe, an apostrophe, exclamation, exclamation mark. Exclamation point. Exclamation mark, the yes. Exclamation point. Yes, exclamation mark. More adventures with Hunter S. Thompson, Milton Klonsky, Jan Menzart. I highly recommend reading this book. Highly recommend um, going on Amazon.com, see all the books that Margaret has, and definitely go on the website because Margaret has a lot to offer, a lot of books, just the courses. Just There's just a lot on there that's uh, great information. I think a wonderful a resource to help people. And you know what? That's what I'm about. That's what Chatting with Betsy is about, providing resources to help people enjoy life, have a better life and to to know they're not alone. And so I want to thank you, uh, Margaret Harrell, for coming on, chatting with Betsy. And I want to thank everyone for listening. And if you don't already subscribe to Chatting with Betsy, it is for free on Spotify, Spreaker, iHeart, YouTube, just to name a few. And folks, I want to help people. So please help me by sharing this show and getting the word out about Chatting with Betsy because that's what I'm here for, and that's my mission. And I also want to thank Jeannie White, his station manager, uh, Pastoral Talk Radio, who writes a blog, produces the show, and that's where you'll, you will find all the information about Margaret Harrell, so please read the blog. And I want to thank Lillian Caldwell, who's CEO of Pastoral Talk Radio, who makes this all possible. And as I always say at the end of my show, folks, in a world where you could be anything, Please be kind and shine your light bright, because if we all did that, think how much better this world would would be, right? We need kindness. We need people shining their light. Don't dim your light for anybody. You keep shining. Keep being kind. You don't know how far your ripples will travel. And as I um, end the show, I'm just grateful. Another uh, thing I want to say is, Happy anniversary, four year of Chatting with Betsy. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to all the publicists and guests that make this show phenomenal. And I'm blessed and I'm grateful to be a host on Passionate Roll Talk Radio and to have Chatting with Betsy. And we will chat again soon. This is Betsy Wurzel 
your host of Chatting with Betsy on Passionate World Talk Radio Network. Bye-bye now.